let's get it rolling. Hello, everybody. Hey, hello. Everybody having fun? It's nice, right? To get skydivers together with lots of different applications for our learning. So, how many people here are riggers? Parachute riggers, we might be doing repairs and things. Good, so that's great. And we have a few that are obviously not. Good. Uh, the, the purpose of this one is to apply some of the information that I've learned through repairing lots and lots of parachutes. So for, for two different parachute manufacturers, I was the guy that had to replace the top skin or you know, deal with it. Recently I had a, a canopy that this is an uncommon damage. IAD, they pulled the pin by accident on the Cessna. The parachute deployed over the tail, student got ripped off, broke a bunch of lines, tore a hole in the canopy. I put it back in service, it's fun to, to see how you can resurrect a dead parachute. But that's not really the kind of stuff we're going to focus on here. This is the stuff that we see every day. The parachutes, little by little, are rare now. There's lots of places where we repeatedly, and I, and I want people to also add your value. Right? You all have seen things that I haven't seen. I've been doing this for a while, but I don't know everything. <laughs> all right, so where do they wear out? We have the canopy gets worn out. There's a bunch of different places we'll talk about that. That's honestly my area of expertise as a manufacturer. Then we got the harness and container. They don't wear out too much. There's, right, we build them really well these days. So there's not that many places, but there's a few spots. Deployment systems, pilot chute, bridle, things like that. Yes, of course. And of course the riders and the toddlers, we get damaged um, in there that are, that are an issue. Let's start with the canopies. So fabric and skins, we get snags, right? Sometimes thorns, right? So I like to hang them up. Do you guys have a way to hang up the canopies with clips? Right? It's the way. It is the best way. In the old days, you lay it in the side pack on your knees and go through it. I want to climb inside the cells and get inside there right? so you can see light shining through. Good light source behind it is vital to be able to see what's going on. Um, so that's, that's a very, very uh, common thing. So I'll go through a canopy that the person assumes is fine and you find a little hole. Now, little holes can become big holes sometimes. And if you notice, sometimes they have a little hole that will last and last and last and it doesn't affect anything. And so you have to think in terms of where does the stress come from and where does it go? We call stress flow. So a line attachment, anywhere near a line attachment, there's going to be a lot more stress and strain in the fabric. So those are the ones you want to pay attention to. Top skin, maybe not so much. Near a bridal attachment, used to be Right? Student canopies, we still have this problem. There's quite a bit of load on the PCA, on the pilot chute attachment. Everybody else has a kill line. Pilot chute, there's not that much load, right? At any point. Uh, so I have noticed cross port damage. Have you guys seen the frayed cross port syndrome? It depends on the shape. I find that the elongated cross ports, shaped like this, Maybe you guys have seen this one, you get a tear in the top and the bottom. They go all the way to the skins, maybe not at first. And that's because this shape doesn't want to stay this shape. When the air blows through it, it wants to turn into a round shape. So where does the stress go? Up and down. Right? Um, it's not a hard repair, usually, if you can get it before it goes all the way to the termination at the top skin and the bottom skin. But look for it. Um, I have experimented with hot knifing again around the cross port if it's starting to look really, really nasty. If you need a plate, a metal plate to put on the other side, and you have to be in your meditation mode. Because, have you ever done this where you're doing a little whoops? <laughs> we had one in the, in the factory where one of the, the people actually dropped a hot knife on a brand new canopy. The lines weren't even on yet. Went all the way to the floor, throw it in the garbage, and then start again. Um, so that's really, really common. And then, of course, seams. So poles. 
People don't look for the poles. I feel like jumpers need to be, when they're packing, look for a snag where the threads get drawn in, where it pulls on, on the thread itself on the exterior always, and it contracts. That contraction will result in it busting the fabric. So when you catch that one, Tony Urabalo taught me this one, with your fingers, you can actually pinch. If this is where the loop is, right? here's your seam. You pinch with your fingers and draw towards the loop. And from the other side, pinch and draw towards the loop. Have you ever tried this? It works. You can actually make the loop disappear. And if you can't make it disappear completely, you take your seam ripper carefully, and you just lift stitches one at a time towards the center point, you make it go away. If not, fine, you snip it off, you run it over, so I would say somewhere around 100 millimeters of over sewing is sufficient. And you draw the threads to the inside, right? And leave them long, don't cut them off short. In other words, you can lose the stitches. That's, I mean, have, have you guys seen this one? You know what I'm talking about where it gets drawn and pulls on stuff? Very, very common. Broken stitches happen, obviously, all the time. So you look for them when you're hanging up. We see nose junctures all the time. I'm not going to say which manufacturer it is, but one of them, you have a lot of the, the, uh, the reinforcing tape fluff. So you have the, the threads that come off. And if it gets long enough, it can hang up on stuff, maybe hang up on the adjacent cell, tie itself together, and yeah, that can result in big, big damage. So just snip it off, but don't hot knife it. You know, the reason why I say that is, any, any threads or, like you say, the fluff that comes off of the reinforcing tape at the nose junctures, that when you hot knife it, it becomes a hard spot. And that solidness can damage fabric. So I would rather have, have it hanging off than somebody hot knifing it, just snip it off and it snips. Um, line attachment and bar tacks, there's one of the manufacturers, again, it's not nice for me to say which one, but I keep seeing the bar tacks for the line attachment tabs losing stitches to the point where it, the tab can actually fall off. I'm not going to say which one, but they tend to be colored tabs. Maybe that gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. Keep your eyes open for that one. And the inboard brake line, right? So we have outboard and inboard. The inboard brake line loads outboard. Does that make sense? So here's my brake lines. It's this one. It pulls that way. There's a lot of force, and it's not pulling on the tail perpendicular. And because it's angular, we actually see a lot of damage on the canopy fabric at that spot. So that's, that's one of the places where I've had to do a lot of patches, uh, where you actually have to take the tab off, open up the tail, and put a square patch and close it. It's a pain in the ass, and it's better to see if you can get it early before it's a problem. So always check those inboard brake lines because of the load angle. Yeah. And of course, pilot sheet attachment point. We don't see too much damage nowadays, but student rigs, right? With an open pilot sheet hanging behind the canopy, particularly where the reinforcing tape, that two and three quarter inch wide tape, where it meets the rib, so at the end of the cell, or joins to the next cell, popping open those stitches all the time. I see that. Um, <clears throat> slider stops. You know, talking about on the end cells, I many times have been walking by somebody as they're packing and go, whoa, 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 <laughs> what's going on here? What do you mean? And the, the, we call it the poker chip. It's actually a fender washer. Is gone. It just, you know, the stitches pop and it falls out, and now the slider goes up unevenly into the canopy during the snivel, and that sucker is not opening on heading. <laughs> yeah, and it can go up and engulf the stabilizer panel, shred it. So keep an eye before the thing actually falls out, you know it's under a lot of stress and vibration and strain, so regularly check those slider stops. Now, very, very common area. Um, and they get holes in, in the reinforcing tape that it's hidden inside of. You've seen it, right? Most people? Hmm? I'm guessing what you've seen. 
All right, so canopy is part two. Suspension lines are a thing. Obviously, we break lines from time to time, but spectral line is the, the longest living line, and you can jump in the, the line set for a thousand jumps. We push them to two thousand jumps in tests without breaking the line. But what's the problem with the spectrum? You guys? Shrinkage. The shrinkage, right? So shrinkage comes from, as far as I can tell, two variables. One is that you don't load the wingtip lines as much as you do the center cell lines, right? You're hanging off the middle of the canopy much, much more. And because you don't have the load, when that slider comes down, the second variable comes in, the friction on the slider as the canopy spans out causes the line to heat up. Anybody know what the melting point, the temperature for spectrum is? 297 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like a hot day in Eloy. It's low. And so hey, try this experiment. If you have a piece of spectral line, just cut off a piece like this and hold it in your fingers like this where you're holding it tight. Take a lighter. And just for that burn in your fingers, just kind of heat it up a little bit and it'll whoop, you'll feel it from in. So it's a combination of the lack of loading and this heating up that results in the canopy bending into a more anhedral arc. <laughs> so my first thought with that was it's going to cause instability, right? By having the weight tips pulled down like this. It turns out that, yes, you have dynamic roll axis instability in the canopy. They, they don't want to fly straight. They don't want to open uh, you know, on a heading. But as far as collapsing goes, I don't think it, it's causing a problem. But what it is doing is the lift vector at the wing tip is now this way because the wing is going like this. So I don't have as much lift out of my end to two cells. And so the parachute doesn't have as powerful a flare. Um, it definitely can affect the opening speed, the amount of altitude you lose. It's something you gotta pay attention to. Um, <clears throat> brake lines have the same problem. The brake lines shrink faster than all the other lines. They don't have as much load, right? I mean, very low. If you think about it, just as you pull down a toggle, that's probably at or less than the stress values of the wingtip lines. So it's also a thicker line, which shrinks faster because it's more surface area to rub against the slider on opening. So that you get a canopy that has lots of slack when it's brand new, and then as it gets older, you have less and less slack. So now you might have a student canopy that can stall when it didn't use to stall because the brake lines are shrunk. You go to full flight, grab the front risers, pull them down, and now the tail is pulled, so you get instability in the way that it performs on the front risers, even though it was perfect at the start. Uh, I find that we have, uh, on average, I mean, obviously it varies on the type of spectra. Um, it's somewhere about nine millimeters per hundred jumps. Seems to be my average figure that I'm, I'm learning. So. That, that can add up to be more, though, on a thicker line, right? So we have the, the skinnier spectrum line. It's smooth, right? When you run your fingers over, it's less friction. But the 750, you know, it's, it's, a, it's fewer carriers. It's a more severe angle, and you get more friction against the slider moments, and you get more shrinkage. The greatest shrinkage I've seen on wingtip A lines, this was on a Sabre 120, it was 14 inches of shrinkage from its original length. We're not talking about small amounts. And so you can end up with a canopy that, that doesn't want to open. In some cases, they want to slam, but usually it's the other way around. But pay attention. So what do you do about that? You can cut off the lines and you know, put a new line set on there, or you can load them again. And I've been doing this for many, many years. You release the RSL, you pull the, cut -off, pull the cut away handle, and thread a pull cord through the three ring, and you tie it to an anchor point that is beefy, that you can really pull against. Your body weight is enough. You just lean on the lines that have shrunk. The outward A, B, C, and D if you have them. Right? Not all canopies have Ds on the wing. 
If you scratch them back, try it. You'll be blown away how much you can extend those. And also the brakes and the D lines, which don't get a lot of friction on deployment, but they don't have very much load. Right? I'll play with the knots on a canopy that's been jumped a lot. The, the, knot, the Lark's head knot at the center A lines is really wide. Go to the D lines and it's loose because your body weight's not carried there. So that's an indication of, of how much that line is being elongated in flight. That means the canopy's trim, right? Its rig rigor's angle of incidence is getting flatter. So it slows down and it changes the way it flies, changes the way it flares. So I stretch the D lines also. Just make sure when you do your stretching that you compare right side to left side, otherwise you're gonna fly in a circle. It's, I mean, has anybody heard of this or tried it? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. It works. But you gotta do it again and again, you know. But it's cheaper than the mindset. <laughs> then we got the slider. Keep an eye on the slider. Uh, and great, it's a great thing that every time you pop the parachute, you can really look at that slider. If the grommets get toasted, if the grommets have dings in them for whatever reason, if they get grooves in them, it's going to trash the suspension lines, right? There's an effect to it. But I see grommets pulling away from the fabric a lot, and I see inward of the rear riser grommets. Um, it varies on the canopy, but you see this, uh, the fabric itself, the ZP, will get big holes from flattering. Even on people that pull the slider down, but much more for the people that leave the slider up. You know, likewise, the people that leave the slider up get more damage to the suspension lines from the flattering. You know, drag slider cross-string helps with that. Pulling it down helps a lot more because we break wing tip lines from that. You know? And of course, the drawstring panels get trashed. Right. You know that one, the, the hole in the drawstring channel on the slider? That there's this little hole that develops in most canopies eventually. And if they don't collapse it all the way, then the finger goes through the hole instead of where it should, and that hole gets bigger. But now every time you do it, it gets stuck in the hole. Right? Um, and so one of the ways it guarantees, well, almost guarantees that it's going to collapse directly is instead of collapsing like this, you get both, you pull out from each other until it pops. And now there's interactive force between the right and the left side of the drawstrings, and it will lock better, and you're less likely to have that happen. <coughs> Harness and container, not as much, right? Thankfully, the rigs are getting really, really beefy, and they're doing a great job, and they still want to keep an eye on the webbing, we want to make sure that the areas that are taking the most load are going to handle it. The hardware is getting better and better. The stainless steel stuff does great. But the older stuff gets tarnished. And I've noticed that if they, you ever see they put a rubber band right here so they can jump without a jumpsuit and they take a bite of their shirt so the shirt doesn't go up over the handles? Well, that rubber band on the hip ring will now leave a residue that will wear out the webbing kind of on the inside where you can't see it. So that's another area to certainly look at, but also tell people, please stop putting those rubber bands on there. Maybe there's a better way to do it where the rubber band isn't on a hardware, but it's, it's important to notice that one. All right. Closing loops, please have an extra one that's preset at the right length with the washer in the room. In, so that it's always ready to go. So when you're in a five minute call and you're like, oh shit, that loop looks really bad. Ah, oh, it'll work one more jump, right? If you have that thought about anything, oh, one more jump, don't do it. <laughs> right? I'm so tired of bags dumping out in free fall or in the airplane. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the keys is to know that you've got one ready to go. Make sure your friends know this idea too. BOC um, spandex and a little tired of pilot sheets slipping out and I'm flying up to somebody. So BOC is, is uh, not an easy repair. It's kind of a pain in the ass from my perspective, but I would much rather just replace it if it's getting 
getting stretched out. Uh, interestingly, with the BOC pouch, I stretched my own out once because I, I was jumping a wingsuit that was kind of on the big side, and I figured if I have a bigger pilot chute, it's going to have more snatch force. If I have a longer bridle, it's going to have you know a little more snatch force because it's out of my arm. But it packs bigger now. So these big pilot sheets in combination with the long bridle is, is scratching it out, and then I switch to my regular one, and now I'm at risk of a premature deployment. I also am at risk of a hard pull, which I had several of when I was using a 34-inch pilot sheet with a 12-foot bridle. It's, you know, I pull it and come out of my hand, and I gotta pull again. So that's, I don't think we need gigantic pilot sheets for racing. I think that was a guess. In the old days, I don't think it makes a difference. The long ride matters. So, handle Velcro wears out. But if, they, if they're constantly practicing by actually peeling, it's going to happen faster. So, you know, when you see people with that, that's their ritual when they rehearse to actually peel the Velcro. So you might want to leave it alone. You know, the hook knife, you want to pull it out and use it for utility purposes. It's not as, as sharp now. So, you want to. Cut things on the drop so and use scissors, not your hook knife. That might be the last way to get yourself out of a wrap. Um, and of course, the, the, the plastic um, gets, gets cracks in it. So feel it, whether you're the rigger or just the jumper. You feel the places you can't see. I try to do a lot of my rigging with my eyes closed for certain things to, to, to feel it. I actually close my eyes so I can kind of go Helen hell Keller, you know I call it. And your, your other senses get, get a little bit sharper. And pilot sheet can be a mesh. I tested one pilot sheet with all kinds of little holes in the mesh. I just kept jumping it to see if it would still work. I had no problem. I, I did about 4,000 jumps on that one pilot sheet and kept pulling. It's the canopy fabric that you have to be concerned with. Um, and you can resurrect them if you need to milk it, but I would say. Rather than spraying it with food grade silicone like I used to do so I can get more jumps out of the pilot sheet, it works by the way. Food grade silicone will resurrect a dead F111 canopy. I mean, what's the difference between F111 and CP? Food grade silicone. And price. <laughs> so I, I would say, based on this test, we shouldn't be worrying as much as, as, as we thought, but the F111 pair of pilot sheets. Certainly, you're getting less snatch force, more bad spin as a result. <clears throat> I've seen a few pins actually come off. So it leaves the pin in the rig and the pilot sheet goes and you got a pilot sheet in tow. Uh, but that's not as common. Um, but I, I have noticed that on the bag end of it, we have that retainer line. I've seen that stuff shred inside the bag. It's another place that people just, they don't look inside enough. Look at these places that you don't know where The closing loop and strength, I think what I, yeah, there we go. Bad lines pulling out, right, on the bag itself, where the bridle goes through, pulling, pulling off, unseating. That concerns me. It doesn't seem like it's that big a deal. But if the grommet on the deployment bag starts to unseat from years of that initial snatch force, you have a space. And that space can catch the closing loop. That happened to a good friend of mine, an ex golden named Chuck Hartree. His closing loop got stuck in the grommet of the bag, the bag couldn't leave, and now the cutaway is not really cutting away. They can kill it. So, Step one, check the rod. Step two, find a way to maybe, like when you pack the bridle, you go this way, then that way. So you're doing this little chicken neck of the bridle. So the bridle itself covers the rod if you have a rig where the, the closing loop is crossing over the back. You know what I'm talking about? So, so as you're getting ready to close the rig, if that uh, the closing loop has a little longer type, it's anchored on the top, it's crossing over the bag, you just S the bridle over the top. Reduces the risk of that. Right. <clears throat> Oops. Um, I missed one thing. I skipped over the kill line. 
Anybody here broken a kill line of the pilot sheet's bridle? There's one, I saw two, it. saw one, three. So there's a few. Why do they, why do they break? Hmm? They get the mic inside the Exactly, it's the friction. It's the friction is the problem, right? It's, it's pretty quick. We can reduce friction. So I can for routines. I think everybody should just, I mean, I've tested it for years. There's no downside. If you go to the pilot shoot end, pull the kill line out, scrunching the bridle. The bridle gets really scrunched up. Pull that kill line out as much as you can. So you can spray silicone lubricant on, on a rag or something and then cover it, or you can use the cypress pad, you know, the gel, and our story, and just lubricate it. Then you go to the back side, do the same thing, pull the kill line out, scrunching it up so you're getting the whole bridle and lubricate it. It'll extend the life of that kill line dramatically. I don't have numbers for you, but I haven't worn one out since I've done that. And then you don't have the shrinkage of the bridle to give us through the kill line, because what's the kill line made of? The material? The spectrum with a low melting point of 297 degrees Fahrenheit. So this prevents the shrinkage, right? So every time you cock your pilot, you're cocking it a little bit less because of the shrinkage. And if you don't have the adequate snatch force, you get back spin, lines, rests, cutaways. And occasionally, nothing. And interestingly, if the kill line gets shrunk, I wish I had a visual aid. It'd be nice to have a camera shooting it so you could all see it. But imagine, if you will, at the location where the bridle attaches to the pilot sheet. Right? The webbing folds around. <laughs> when the kill line collapses, pilot chute. The handle at the center of the pilot chute will come up to the bridle. If the kill line is too short, it'll ram into that crotch and split. This is the indication that the kill line is too short as those stitches start to pop out. Little by little by little. And recently, we have one of them that the stitches, the zigzag stitching that's on either side of the kill line split completely off. The pilot chute, after he threw it, came off completely, inverted, and it was only hanging from the kill line. So the guy went, oh, well, that's not much of a parachute. And he pulled the handle, thinking, I'm done, right? I've got a spy hook. <laughs> and he never pulled this one. And he never got a parachute until the helmet was off. <laughs> Saved his life from the Cypress. 8,000 miles. So it says we need to be rebriefing, even as experienced jumpers, you know, reversing ourselves in these conclusions. And I, personally, I think we need to revisit, and this isn't within the scope of what we're supposed to be talking about here, but pilot shoot and tow. Keep talking about what we should do. Keep discussing whether we should cut away and dump the reserve or if we should just go to the reserve, observe the deployment, and then cut away. Think about the pros and cons. Because when you cut away in free fall, belly to earth, the risers often come out, sometimes slapping around. And I've seen a number of, of entanglements and even fatalities from this method of pro pilot shooting tow instead of this method. Just discuss. <laughs> and wrong <clears throat> so the toggle keepers are guaranteed to wear out even the good ones. And toggle fires become increasingly common. And, and who's had a toggle fire on opening, one toggle releasing? Well, there's quite a few that haven't. I'm surprised. I thought every hand was going to go up. <laughs> Maybe you replace your risers more often than I do. But it's a problem, right? And of course, I think we should be teaching, if you fire a toggle, get on the rear riser and hold the head in, then release the toggle. Rather, rather than just saying, you know, release the toggle, by then you've done some pretty good spinning, what if you spun down into a canopy that's underneath you? So anchor it to the head in as soon as you realize that that toggle popped. Um, you can, if you're at, let's say you're at a boogie, 
If you don't have access to a sewing machine, your toggles, you slip, they slip out and in really, really easy. You can take a rubber band, cut it, wrap it around the tip of the toggle, and shove that in to the top, and it actually snugs it up pretty good to get you for the weekend. We call it a boogie fix, quick and dirty. Far better to do it the right way. <coughs> when I say load induced narrowing, can you guess what I'm talking about? At the tip of the tunnel, the cat's eye on the brake line loads it harder up against the guide room, and it causes a narrow spot. And that narrow spot, in combination, especially with spectral line cat's eye shrinkage measure, it should start off as about 25 millimeters, that hole in the rate line. It will get smaller and smaller on the spectral lines. So when you combine those two of the narrowing on the top and the smaller cat's eye hole, you end up with somebody unsewing the toggles, but not really unsewing the toggles. <laughs> Has anybody else seen that one? So they go to full flight and they're actually still in half breaks. And what happens when they flare? Yeah, it's false. It's a shame. <laughs> and it's how would you get that out? Or better yet, how would you teach somebody? So when you unsew the toggles and you say, wow, it never came out of the cat's eye. So I believe it once. <laughs> I've never successfully been able to just yank it off. Actually, I have one student who like 50, 60 jobs of this happened. Yeah. So, so I just took that one kind of way. <clears throat> cool, so now. Try this. Grab the line, pull down, then pop it up. <laughs> so you take the load off of the cat side and comes right What I'll do for, <clears throat> for a repair is I'll take pliers on the tip of the toggle and squeeze the back part so it's in a uniform width. You don't necessarily need the toggles, you just gotta pinch it. it. And it happens to all of us, right? All of our toggles have that little waist to them after a while. All right, three ring closings. For, for a while, and this is culture in many drop zones, before they pack, they put a pull-up cord through the three rings and tie the three rings together, usually not tight enough for my tastes, to prevent the, the rig from offsetting, right, and get it off head and open if, if, the, if the, the risers were offset. The problem is, <clears throat> you often with the very first bite that they take in the lines as they're, as they're packing, because everything is facing them down, because you've drawn it all in with that pull-up cord, now you're dragging the three ring closing loop on the carpet. And it's wearing it out. So I either use a drag mat. Does anybody still have a drag mat? Anybody? There's two. Okay, that's good. The last two. <laughs> Most people are too lazy to use them. They're great. Instead, I would say split the risers. Don't bother tying them. And just make sure you reference back to the cascade point on the brake lines to make sure you have symmetry. But this wrapping everything under causes um, the wear and tear on the loop. All right. So um, at this point, I'll go to, to any sort of questions that you might have on this stuff. Yes. Um, maybe, so I have a question in the comment. Um, make close loop. Uh, historically, it's tied to a on most of the rigs. Yeah, we do. The white. The, the wider ones. Yeah. yeah. But um, fashionably, there's a lot of uh, uh, stores and uh, skydivers that put a diverse of closing loop from different materials because they want the uh, purple and pink and, and my question, and it's sold in stores. Um, mm -hmm. And some manufacturers started to apply, I believe uh, historically it was put there because it has some criteria to answer uh, the, the opening and the friction and whatever. 
What is your thoughts about it? It's funny you should mention just recently, it was like a month ago, this guy had all these fancy colored closing moves, like fashion closing moves. And on the first pack job, I watched a guy break one of those moves. It was very pretty color, but it wasn't strong. <laughs> so I think we have to, certain things you put in the fashion department, the jumpsuit or whatever, but not blue. So I think we shouldn't mess with it, you know? Friction is significant, right? So if you use spectrum, it's very strong, but it's also lower, you know, lower friction, so you can end up with the pin stripping out of there with the, just the breath of air that <laughs> comes out. So I don't like that. So, so, so I mean, when I get the uh, room for parking and it has uh, some color from the uh, main, I, it's your ass. I, I, I replace it to uh, uh, what I know is needed, and I return it to the owner for him to understand that I don't approve, but it's rigged to do whatever he wants. And the second comment was the, about the VOC, yeah. because there were a few materials uh, in the past few years that have issues with materials. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend on my uh, uh, customers, most of the time, the rig is not jumping. Yeah. So you can pack it at the end of the day, don't put the... Uh, Thank you. Keep it out. And, mm -hmm. and then I won't replace it uh, next year or next season. We will both save the time and you'll save the money. Exactly. I agree completely. Especially long-term storage. And, and, I, and I have rigs with uh, a few hundred, more than a few hundred jobs and the VOC pockets. It's toast. Like, it's I have a comment with that. <laughs> I have my personal rig, I have like 1500 jumps on BOC. I have a factory in the field, still tight, but, I, well, I, can but it, I utilize the whole length of the BOC. Mm -hmm. Like, I really need to pack my pilot shoes. Yeah. And like, I don't have a problem with long term storage or so. Right. Yeah. I mean, the way that you pack it obviously is very significant, you know, in terms of so if it's big and fat, you're stretching out. Uh, the, the pouch, but he was just referring to the, the sort of longer pouches um, in a longer pack job. Um, and it, there is a, one particular pack job that I recommend that you can find on YouTube. Yes, we know that. Yeah, most people know it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's important. Uh, so, other comments or, or additions, right? I know this is not an exhaustive list of things that can go wrong, it's just the most common things that I see. <laughs> about uh, different kind of uh, lines material, because we were talking about spectra line. That's like, right. Yeah. Uh, Thank now, you. now manufacturers like use, use HMA lines yeah. uh, or vector lines. Yeah, I mean, the, I've noticed that the HMA doesn't discolor as much as the vector. So the vector, especially when you, in combination with the stainless steel rods, causes a lot of blackening of the line. Which may or may not be correlated with with weakness, but you can see that it's been jumped a lot, right? But as far as overall longevity, I only found that uh, the that trend seems to last better in the desert than the HMA does. If they're jumping in the, you know, a place where it's green and it's not likely to get grit inside there, it doesn't matter. They they, they both seem to be great. Right? I've been building canopies with both, sort of alternately, to see what the problems are. It's not a problem, but the HMA, again, it may still look good when it's got 500 jumps. I'm not going to jump a line set with that pin or HMA past 500 jumps. No way. I would recommend dropping the lines off by 4 or 425. Better than losing your canopy. <laughs> Know, better than having it break when you're in a dive on the landing. Um, but <clears throat> the, I mean, we see fat bronze still exists, especially for the you know, older folks. I get neck pain from doing too many camera jumps with heavy stuff. It's awesome. Does anybody here have fat bronze lines for that purpose for softer, softer openings? Students also. Well, students, of course, yeah. Um, if you have the pack volume, and you really want to have soft openings, it will blow your mind. And you would expect that these thicker lines are going to lose speed, you won't notice it. It's not that different. Unless you actually measure your speed, you'll see a little bit of a difference. The openings are better. You're less likely to get slammed. Bring up, the, when you see Bill Booth bring up this topic, he thinks that micro line is the devil's. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I think they're both fine. They're really skinny ones for competition. 
be very, very careful. The sheathing that some of the manufacturers are doing at the link, right, at the bottom of the loop on the very, very skinny line is working to extend the life of it. It's kind of complicated in the way that it's built, but absolutely, that helps. That's really cool. I do that for my customers for this. Or you guys just... 400 and below. Yeah. yeah. I, I haven't been doing it for 400, but... Mm -hmm. What about air porosity? About air permeability, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, most of the zero P now is pretty good. But some of them are not, and we'll end up, with, particularly I noticed with canopies that are built in asymmetric color patterns, as they age, maybe the right side is black and it maintains its permeability longer, and this side maybe is brighter, fluorescent pink, and now because we've got different permeability, the parachute wants to turn left now. So I recommend asymmetric color patterns for that purpose. It doesn't guarantee that that's the case. There are certainly times when there's, there's uh, a very thick layer of silicone on pink fabric. I'm not saying I'm nothing against pink, but the, the fluorescence often will seem to, to degrade faster. I've noticed that as well. The black seems to last for longer. When we run all the colors up a flagpole and leave it in the sun for a long time, the black seems to work the best. Does it mean that it's the best to be seen at sunset? No. <laughs> so that's another variable, really. I mean, being seen under canopy helps prevent the canopy collision. If you got to cut away, you're more likely to find it, unless you have a tracker, uh, a pole. How many people have, are using a tracker like in the bag after a cutaway? One? Just the one. Huh. Which one are you using? The tracker. The Apple uh, AirTag, yeah. I, I think we should consider how much is an AirTag compared to how much is a main parachute. Plus risers, plus bag, you know, get yeah, $300 removable slider and all this stuff. It's a pretty expensive toy. It's just something to think about. It's kind of duck, like a fabric dye. Mm -hmm. And uh, longevity of the fabric. But some colors stay longer. It does seem that that's the case, but my conclusion so far, because I'm still collecting data, I've only been building parachutes for 27 years, there's a lot more data than crunch, um, is that the, the longevity can be correlated with the color. Right? So in other words, this dye lot ha happened to have kind of a light coating of the silicone, or the solar max coating that protects it, protects it from UV. On that one, it's a little bit stronger, and so that one was longer. And you say, oh, it's the green is better. It's not always the green is better, it's just this dye line is better. So it's, it's, so the the batch. It, it's the batch. You can't necessarily okay. uh, predict. Yeah. Going back to the trackers, do you have favorite spots where you put them? Because I get asked a lot lately. I like the bag. Yeah, but where exactly also do you have preference? Well, not on the flap. Right, because the yeah. flap is doing a lot of work. It's flapping around, right? And I, I like it on the top. Some of them you have to pop the pin during the week when you're not jumping and charge the thing in some cases. So you ease the access, I think, is really important, but not centered. I think it should be a little bit off center because you've got a, a lot more, especially on a, where the anchor point of the top of the closing loop is going to be, you know, on the top of the flap and across. You could damage it. So I think a little bit off center. But easy access, and make sure that that pouch, whatever you built, has a little uh, pleat in it so it's loose, so that so you're not squeezing the thing too much, so it's easy to get it in and out. Right. Hmm? I've seen some in the risers as well. If you have like a full RTS, it would be better. For sure. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense because it's entirely possible that you oops, fumble the ball. <laughs> Uh, hacky would be best. Hmm? Hacky would be best. Hacky theoretically would be best. However, the hacky has more than one function. Right? So once you throw it, if you've increased the weight of the hacky, you've increased the chances of a pilot to run. Actually, the hacky, uh, the high boost option, the high boost on the four way thing, they got it in the hacky. And it's working? Yeah. No problems? No problems. Okay. Yeah. 
I mean, obviously you want to look at the pilot sheet size and type and see if that's correlated, because some of these pilot sheets are pretty small, right? I mean, the, the snatch, the squirrel snatch, it's a tiny little pilot sheet, it's very efficient, but now you could tip the balance, literally, <laughs> especially in the beginning part of the opening. Um, just something to, to consider. And some of our concerns are not valid, it's just our first thought, right? Like the, the tube stoves. For years, they said, don't use tube stoves, it's a bad idea, because it's so strong, it's going to cause bag locks, right? Because especially the closure stoves, you could like, hang your body made off of this stove, and it could cause bag locks. So I said, don't do it, don't do it. And I didn't do it. And then I've been observing people that have it. I haven't seen a bag lock from tube stoves. Has anybody in the room seen a bag lock caused by a tube stove? There's one. Okay, data point. This one can think about. I mean, I do like the idea of one of those things just being able to, to get broken by the pilot sheet, which is you know, 60 or 70 pounds of drag and terminal. But not a hot and hot. Right? Lazy, lazy speed. Any other additions to where shit keeps wearing out? Slings? If the slinks are turned sideways with the tab sticking out, and they don't pull the slider down, the grommet vibration has worn through. I know at least one slink that broke because of the combination of the slink turned sideways and the person that wasn't pulling their slider down. It vibrated it to death. So turn them sideways, either tap them down, Please, if you're going to use gaffer's tape, instead of tacking it like with sewing, if you're going to do the, the gaffer's tape around the bottom of the riser to keep it in place, that gaffer's tape needs to go through the riser first and around. Because if you just go around, especially if you, know, that, uh, you can have some hot conditions, the Golden Knights had to, had to outlaw because it's so humid in Rayford. The, the gaffer's tape wrap was sliding up the lines, causing a spinning malfunction. So that's why I said just go through the riser first so you, you guarantee it's going to stay down. And if you're going to remove that during, you know, line replacement or something, wait for it to be cooled off. If it's a hot day when you peel off that tape, it's going to be dark like up in the riser. I like to serve them instead. And if you're going to sew, if you're going to tack them down, make sure there's no tension on that little loop of, of super tack at all. Push it up on the slink before you pierce through the riser. And use contrasting thread colors, please. <laughs> you know, the black riser with black tacking, and then you go, oops, I got a piece of your riser, sorry. Hmm? We're done? I'm not looking at the clock, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> We got. All right. Yeah. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, no worries. No. Well, I mean, I just I like to field you know information from the crowd. You guys know stuff that I don't know. <laughs> That's it. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Brian Germain, and thank you for joining.